Well, good Sunday afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you once again for tuning in to the Sunday service here at Promise LA Facebook page. Uh, I got some, over the next few weeks, I got some exciting news to share with each and every one of you. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, as we see the, the the end of this tunnel that we've been in the last couple of weeks, a uh, few weeks, last couple of months, um, that we'll actually get to be in a in a sanctuary setting doing this live, uh, and um, you know, hopefully even have some time of worship. Uh, I know that uh, things are a little bit different uh, doing it this way, but you know, uh, it just was impressed on my heart to come and share God's word to you, even even this way. And so, uh, look forward to the next few weeks as we are hopefully to take a next step in our ministry. Uh, come to bring you a, a, a full service here. And so I, I hope you uh, are will be in prayer with me about that. There's there's still some work to do. Amen. And so um, but uh, I, again, I, I'm, I'm excited. I, I see that we're uh, I'm hoping that we're, we're we see the light ahead at the end of the tunnel that we're able to move forward uh, and we'll be able to to hug one another, to say hello to one another. Um, I, I will tell you this, that I'll never take another hug for granted ever again. And so uh, praise God for that. Uh, if you were with us last week, you, uh, you'll know that we had started a, a series in the book of Ephesians. I think it's an exciting book uh, just based on on some of the uh, background settings and, and where the, the, the church in Ephesus was and is, uh, where, where the Apostle Paul planted and the people he was addressing and ministering to and bringing the message of the gospel. Uh, Last week, we studied that in in, in Ephesians chapter one, that the apostle Paul had had a prayer. He had a a longing, a a desire for the church that in in, in the first chapter, he says, I pray that you would understand the hope of your calling, meaning that you would understand that that when, when you're drawn into this great relationship with Jesus Christ, when you put your faith and your trust in the in in, in the in the cross and the blood that was shed for our sins and in the resurrection, his resurrection from the dead, that you you understand that uh, uh, that there's a calling in this relationship. There's something to it. And we studied last week that that not only are you chosen, not only are you uh, uh, adopted into the family of Christ and the family of God, but you're accepted into the beloved. And, and we talked about that in, 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 in some length. And, and I want to encourage you, if you missed that message, uh, go back. The, these things are all posted on this Facebook web, website. And I, w- I want to encourage you to go in. And, uh, and if, you, if you missed that message, go, go and listen to that again. I think it was a great message. If you have any questions, uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to, to answer them for you if you just reach out to us. Um, and we're, we're entering into an exciting time as we go into uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, because not only does when, when Paul left it last week that that we were chosen and we were adopted and that we're accepted into the beloved, but this this in this chapter he he steps it up a little bit, amen. He steps it up by saying that that we are God's workmanship, or or uh, the the New Testament translation says that we are His masterpiece. Check this out in in, in Ephesians chapter two verse ten. It says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Uh, And again, let me go back and reiterate that in in, uh, the New Living Translation, that workmanship is actually translated masterpiece. And I love that because we are God's masterpiece his, his the, the the masterpiece is defined as a a, will, a work of outstanding artistry or skill um or work amen uh, a work of outstanding artistry skill or work if you, if you know some of the the masterpieces that we recognize today sometimes it's taken years and, and it's taken trial and it's taken hardship for for an artist or a or a uh, a musician or even an architect to come up with their greatest masterpiece, something that they'll be known for. And you and I are God's masterpiece. The reason why I like that is because a masterpiece does two things. A masterpiece uh, points back to its creator, amen? A masterpiece points back to the, to the creator. 
I mean, let me put it this way. Uh, you, you can never think of the Mona Lisa without thinking of Leonardo uh, da Vinci. Amen. You, you can never think about um, uh, great expectations or, or um, the Christmas Carol without thinking of Charles Dickens. You can never think of, of the twist without Chubby Checker. Amen. Or even uh, go into your, your iPhones or any Apple software without thinking about Steve Jobs. You know, I don't know about you because I'm a, I'm a real estate guy that, that uh, I, I know very lot of famous architects and, and whatever city I'm in, whether it's L.A. or even Las Vegas or New York City, I, I would love to go check out the buildings, uh, certain buildings, and, and uh, just go do a sightseeing on them because I knew that they were done. By, by certain architects and, and that's an art in a sense. And it's, it was their masterpiece. And, and I wouldn't just go look at any building. I would wanna go see their masterpiece. You and I are God's masterpiece. Another thing that a masterpiece does is, is not only does it point back to the creator, but it also tells a story, a story of hardship, a story of, of, of persistence and perseverance. A story of, uh, of, of, of sacrifices being made because somebody believed in a dream of creating this masterpiece. Did you know that uh, over the course of time, God has a dream for you and I, that we are his masterpiece. We have a story to tell. God is actually telling a story through you and through me. We are his masterpiece. Have I said that enough? We are his masterpiece. So the question, uh, that needs to be asked today is that if we are his masterpiece, what kind of story are we telling? If a masterpiece tells of a story, what kind of story are you and I telling? Uh, I, I believe there's three things in which the book of Ephesians tells us what kind of story that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, God's masterpiece, created beforehand for good works in Christ that were of a story that we need to tell. That, that we are to tell. There's three things in Ephesians chapter two that I wanna go over that we're, as we unpack these passages of scripture, I want you to see, can you see these things in your story? Can you see these things in your story? Let's, let's go to prayer first, shall we? Father God in heaven, I just wanna give you thanks and praise. I thank you there, Father God, for you are so good. And Lord God, even even to get us here to, to, to preach your word, Lord God, to, to, to teach it, dear Father, uh, just shows how much you're, you're trying to reach out to your people. And, and so I pray right now, dear Father God, that, that you would anoint this word, that it would be truly be yours, Lord, that these words would not be coming out of my mouth, but they'd be coming out of your heart, and it will accomplish all that which you have purpose for it to do. And so I pray for your blessings right now, God. I pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would anoint me as your, as your mouthpiece that you would uh, hide me behind the shadow of the cross once again, that you would, uh, uh, that I would decrease and that you would increase and that you would be magnified in this word. Oh, blessed, I pray, dear Father God, give me the strength, give me the wisdom, give me the anointing that needs to be done to deliver the word just as you would want it to be. And at the end of this all, Lord God, that, uh, that you would receive glory, dear Father God, for the hope in which you, you give to your people. Thank you for your goodness, Lord, and thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The first thing that we talk about a story, about our story, is that we, we were once dead and we're now alive. What, we're once dead and now alive? I know, I, I know that once you hear this, you're like, dead? What does that mean? Check this out. In, in beginning with verse one, it says, and, and, and you, he made alive, who were dead in your trespasses and sins, and which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. It says, well, we walked in, in, in the ways of this world. We walked in the, uh, according to the, to the prince of the power of the air, meaning, meaning Satan himself. We, we, we walked according to, to in, the, in disobedience, understanding we, we know that this is God's word and this is God's will, but yet we walk contrary to that anyway. We were sons of disobedience. And, and the Bible says that because of that, we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. 
And, and, and I know as you listen to yourself, like, uh, preacher, really? I, I, I know I may not be a religious person, but dead? I, I know that I made some mistakes, and I and I know I, I, I've uh, I've sinned, and and I know that I can't do this. Uh, I, I I can't walk the way that that Christians walk. I I can barely call myself a Christian, only because I believe. But but really dead. Two things you need to know. It's one I did not make this up. Amen. This was in the scriptures. The Bible says in in in, in Genesis verse. Genesis 2, verse 17, it says, God says to, to Adam, it says, For in the day that you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. It says that in the day that you eat from the from the from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall die. Now, in, in the definition of, of, of dying, amen, and, and, and how it's used, it means a separation. From God, it means because you're disobedient, because you you have sinned and sin came into this world, we're now separated from God. And, and, and I know that sounds a little bit easier. Okay, separated, I get that a little bit more than 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 dead. But but understand that it is God who gives life. It is God who 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 breathed into us. Amen. The Bible says that it is in Him that we live, breathe, and have our being. And and, and without God, that that, that we're surely we are meant to die. See, one thing we, we don't realize is that Adam wasn't meant to die. Oh, yes, he, he lived hundreds of years. I get that. But he wasn't meant to die. But because sin came in the world, death happened. Amen? And, and, and so listen to, listen to what else this says. In, in John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus tells the people, he says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So let me say this again. For therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, meaning the Messiah, the Lord who is to come to die for your sins and for mine, then you'll die in your sins. If you haven't put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you will die in your sins. Doesn't get any, any more straightforward than that, amen? So, so we in in church terminology we call that being spiritually dead. You have no spiritual life in you. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to uh, limit it to saying spiritual life. You just have no life in you. You may be alive. You may be breathing and all this other stuff right now, breathing in a mass these days. Amen. But uh, but but you really have no life in you. But the other thing is that I want you to know is that we've all been through this. We've all been disobedient. Amen. Because in verse 3 it says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. See, we, we've all done that. So, I mean, as I preach to you here today, I, I, I don't come to you saying, oh, you need to be as good as me. You need to be as good as a preacher. You need to be good as as all them spiritual people wearing the Christian t-shirts. and you know, Because the Bible says that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. Romans 3.23. And, and, and the Bible also says in Romans 6.23 that, that the wages of sin is death. That Boy, that sounds harsh. That means if I steal a candy bar, I'm deserving to die. If I lie, I'm deserving to die. If, if, I, if I just slipped up once, I, I'm deserving to die. And see, I think one of the things that we, we fail to see is that we compare ourselves with other people. And we say, what I've done is not as bad as what other people have done. I, I know somebody else who's a lot worse than me. But see, we don't compare ourselves with other people. We don't even compare ourselves with ourselves. Compare yourself to the, to the mighty, holy God in which we serve, in which, in which we long one day to live with forever and ever and ever in heaven. Because that's what we strive for, amen? is one day have that relationship with God. And, 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 and the one thing that I want to tell you, despite all this that I'm telling you about, about being spiritually dead, there is good news because the good news is that we serve a God who, who, who takes dead things and brings them back to life. Amen. We have reason to rejoice because we serve the God of the resurrection. We serve the God who, who, who looks at things as they were dead and, and raises them up as if it were nothing. You know, I, I really wanted to to go through and, and, and go through the, the Bible and count how many times 
J Jesus or, or in the Old Testament, God himself raised people from the dead. You know, you can look about at the, the, the young man who, who had a headache and he says, my head, my head, and how he died. And, and, and God used Elisha to raise him up. You could talk about the, the, the son of the, the, the woman from Zephyrath, I think it's called, and how God used Elijah to, to, to raise that young man up to, to, to die. He raised him up to, from the dead. You, you could look in the New Testament and how, how, uh, how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and, and even into the book of Acts where, where Dorcas was, was raised. But you know what? The greatest, as we much look at that, as we look at that, that, that the greatest work of, of, of raising people from the dead is what God does with you and I today. Amen. What God does when, when we are stuck in our sin and stuck in our disobedience and, and rendered dead, spiritually dead, fully dead, de destined to, for an eternity in hell, destined to, for judgment. Yet God quickened us alive. Look at this in, in, um, in verse four and five. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace that you have been saved and raised us up together in places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Saying that in Christ because of his grace, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit, but because of his grace, even though we were once dead, see, death seems like an impossibility for us, amen? Once they're dead, they're dead. I, I don't know about you, but I, 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 I've, I've never been to a funeral and, and, and gone over to the, to the body and say, oh, uh, I, I hope that he raises a little bit. There's a hope that he raises before, before we shut this coffin. Because in our minds, once you're dead, you're dead. But God, even though we were dead in our sins and trespasses, quickened us to be alive. And because of that, we, we, we have freedom to live for him today. Amen. We have freedom to, to, uh, to, to, to be obedient to God. We have freedom to trust in God, understanding that he loves us and he wants nothing but good for us. Amen. Because he's, he shows that as he's made us alive today in Christ Jesus. The second thing that uh, that our story um, it needs to tell is that what we were once far away, but now we're family. Or in other words, we were once foreigners, but now we're we're family. In verses eleven and twelve, it says this: "That says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that is called circumcision, made in the flesh by hands." that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. It says that you were once aliens of the commonwealth. You, you, you were strangers from the covenant of promise. And basically what, what the apostle Paul is saying here is that, you know, back in the day in, in the Old Testament, the the nation of Israel was considered to be the God's chosen people. And as God was moving in, in the nation of Is, through the nation of Israel, their fame spread out through, through all the other nations. You can look in the book of Joshua chapter six that as, as the nation of Israel was coming to invade Jericho, that, uh, that the, the Bible says that as, as the, the people of Jericho, even though they had thick walls and there were a fortified city, as they saw the nation of Israel coming, the, the Bible says that they were they were fearful because they had heard what God was doing in their lives. And so what had happened as 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 Israel kept on going from conquest to conquest, gaining land after land, going in and and uh, and, and taking possession of the, the promised land, a land flowing of milk and honey. As they were going through all that, many of the uh, other nations, some of them had converted over to to, to be followers of God. Some some migrated and said, no, we want to be your people. But yet, because of the fact that what happened sociologically, I guess you could say, is that they had, um, that once people had migrated, and even though people were, were uh, you know, thought they were going to be citizens of Israel now, they were still 
treated as being a second rate citizens. They're still treated as being unclean. You know, the it says that you were called uncircumcised by the circumcision. Now, what that means is that during that time that, um, you, you know, the the people of Israel needed to show themselves a, a mark or a, or a symbol of that they were belonged to God. And for some reason, God chose that that mark should be circumcision. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I was there, I was like, couldn't I just wear a name tag or something? But yet God chose circumcision. And even though some wanted to be circumcised and some wanted to be some uh, to be a part of the nation of Israel and be and be grafted in, so to speak, or migrate in and get their citizenship. They were still considered as part of the uncircumcised. They're treated as second rate citizens. Very often they that would cause them to to live in poverty, to live as slaves, you know, and and and, and maybe there's some of you out there that feel the same way. You, you, you've come to church. You, you, you've raised your hand during the uh, during the invitation to re receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But yet somehow the, the circumstance around you, your situation, you, you, you have a feeling that that, yes, you, you're 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 saved, but you're you, you consider yourself second rate because you're you you don't see yourself as being spiritual as some of the other people in the church or as other Christians that, 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 you know, maybe it's the pastor who lives down the street or your or your grandma or your grandpa who's been following Jesus for a long time. And you don't feel the same way. I want to tell you that there's hope for you because in verse uh, 13 and 14, it says, because, but now in Christ, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. You haven't been brought near by your works. You haven't been brought near because of how many scriptures you've memorized. You haven't been brought near because, because uh, uh, of, of your circumstance and your situation dictates that you have prosperity. Oh. Hear me out these days because that prosperity doctrine will will psych you out really bad and it'll cause you to live a defeated life. And I, I want to tell you that it's not about that. He says you've been brought near because the blood of Jesus. Amen. The blood of Jesus. Verse 14 says, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. See, when Jesus Christ came, there, well, there was no there was no class there there was no barriers there was no second rate this or first rate that the, the there was no there is no separation we're all one in christ jesus the bible says it doesn't matter if you're a male or 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 a female or if you're a greek or a scythian we are all one in christ jesus amen and and, and it, that you should know that he is not a respecter of person so what he wants to do with others he wants to do with you Amen. We are a family. We are a family of God. I used that that passage of scripture last week. It's one of my favorites in all the Bible, where 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 the where uh, the apostle John says, "Oh, what manner of love! Oh, what manner of love that uh that that God has for us that that He would that He would call us children of God. He's called you and I children of God because He loves you. He didn't call you a second rate child. He didn't call call you to." to have different classes in your Christianity. Zephaniah 317 says, for the Lord God is in our midst and he is able to save and he will save. He will rejoice over you. He will sing over you and he will rejoice. He will rejoice with gladness, the Bible says. That's how he looks at you. He rejoices over you. He's in your midst and he will save. No matter what you're going through right now that causes you to feel uh, that, that you're not all that God has you to be, the Lord God is in your midst. Amen. That is part of your story. John 15, 15 says this. It says, no longer do I call you slaves, but I have called you friends. That You see, your friends, your, your, your friends you're called into a relationship with. with amen. You, 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 you hang out with your friends. You talk with your friends. You, you, you text your friends. You, you talk about things you have in common, whether it be sports, whether it be clothes, whether it be motorcycles, or but most of all, it's, it's about Jesus. Amen. And, and indeed, Jesus is your friend, much more than just your friend, but he's family. We're in a relationship with God. The third thing that your story should say is not only that 
that, that you are just living, but you are living for him. But that you are living for him. In, in verse 20, it says that having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. I, I, again, let me explain this to you, what what uh, what the apostle Paul is saying. Hey, you remember those, those prophets and apostles, how we held them in high regard, how we looked at them as, as holy men and women, as we looked at them as, uh, as, as patriarchs to our faith. You're a part of that now. When, as Jesus Christ is your cornerstone, we're all being built up into a living temple, the body of Christ, where Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. You see, the cornerstone was uh, was was really just that, the the a stone in the corner of a building. But even more so is that whatever way that that uh, that stone was shaped or was angled is going to dictate how the, the other parts of the building is going to look like. So if it was a right angle, if that cornerstone was a, in a right angle, then, then the rest of that will be a right angle, or at least the walls there. If it, was, if it was a little bit crooked or whatnot, then the building would be crooked, you know? And, 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 and Jesus Christ is our chief cornerstone. The way he is built up, we are also being built up. We're called to be just like him in Christ's likeness. We're, we're to live in him, with him, and for him. Amen. And, and, and the Bible talks about in, 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 uh, in here is that we are being built up together for a dwelling place for the spirit of God. We are being built up. And we, we, the way we're built up is that we're, we are living for him. In the same way that that the the building goes in the direction of the of the of the cornerstone, the way that's going, so should our lives be. The way Jesus directs our lives to be lived, that's the way we ought to live. The Bible says that we ought to live in Christ's likeness. Amen. To be more and more like Jesus, to go from faith to faith, and to go to glory to glory by the Spirit of our God. Oh, it doesn't, it, not that it can't happen all at once, but sometimes it's a process. Most of the time we grow in maturity. Most of the times we grow to be more and more like Jesus. And and, and the, the question I want, I asked for you though, is that are we living for him? I, I was going through a seminar this past week and um, how, and we looked at some research studies of, of, uh, Christians and how they perceive things and what a Christian is to be like. And most of most mostly people uh, who have who have been a part of the church, they, they come to church, they're active in church. But to be actually living uh, outside of the church is something a little bit more foreign to them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can't remember the percentages of all night. And, and and I and I believe what what the reason the reason is is because there is no concept of what it means to live for Jesus, not in the church, not in the uh, not 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 in the the life groups, but but in your everyday life, in your work, your uh, your 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 school. And I know that hardly anybody is actually on the campus these days, but or, or or maybe what they call third places, the the third place that you hang out. Maybe it's a gym, or or maybe it's a a coffee shop, or whatever that may be. Are you living for him today? Check this out. Numbers chapter 32. Uh, if you know the story, God was leading the nation of Israel right right into the promised land. He says, hey, guys, the time is, has come where where I am. I'm taking you guys in. Uh, there's 12 tribes of Israel that they were marching in and they were coming in and they were saying, this is going to be great. We This is something that, that our fathers had told us about. Now we get to go in. And, 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 and as they're entering into the promised land, the, they're, they're out of the 12 tribes, there were two and a half tribes, Gad, uh, Reuben, and a half of Manasseh, which were tribes, that, that they said as they were approaching the, the River Jordan, which bordered the Promised Land, they, they looked at the land and say, hey, there's a lot of greenery here. Hey, this place is beautiful. 
I think this is good enough for us. I think this is good enough. We don't need to enter, to cross over to the Jordan where the promised land is. This is good enough. And so they stayed on the east of the Jordan instead of crossing over with the rest. And they decided to say, they said, you know, we're just going to hang out here and this is good. And 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 here's my question for you. Why not get all that God has for you? God has an amazing plan for your life. He has a, a plan and a purpose, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and your and a hope. But yet um, so many times we, we stand in the land that is of good enough. This is good enough for me. I don't need to, to press in. I don't need to do more. I don't need to, to, uh, to, to, to move in faith where God is leading because my life is good enough. God has a plan and a, a, and to, to, for prosperity for you. Not, not money per se, but, but, but he, is, he wants to prosper you. Watch, a lot of you are standing on the east end of the Jordan when he's asking you to cross over. You know, as I, I finish up this message here today, I, I want to ask you, does this story look like your story? Does your story look like you you passed from death to life, that you you left a life of disobedience, you left a life of, uh, of, of sin dictated by, by the influences of, of Satan himself? And have you have you been quickened alive? Have have, have do you got are you living a, a new life in Christ? Your your value system has changed, your your perspective has changed. The who you call Lord is now different. Amen. Because it's a lordship issue. Have you passed from death to life? Have have you moved from 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 being a foreigner to being a family member? Are you closer to God today than you were yesterday? Are you closer to God today than you were last year around this time? The, the the way you know that is because you know more about God, not just the scriptures, although that's where you start. Amen. But but do you know more of your purpose of what you would have you to do? Have you grown from maturity? Have you looked towards have you have you looked towards Christ likeness in your life? Do you look more like Jesus today than you did last year? And and most of all, are you living for him? Is, is he the Lord of your life? Is he, is, have you acknowledged him in all the decision making you're, you, you need to make, whether it's your job, whether it's your, your home, whether it's your relationships? Are you living for him? And, and in all honesty, maybe there's a lot of you that will say, no, I, I don't know. That's where I'm at. Let, let me let me tell you something because it's not to heap condemnation on you. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm not trying to say that oh you're not as spiritual. That's not what I'm trying to say. But if you noticed in this passage of scripture in in, in Ephesians chapter two, you'll hear words like grace and mercy quite a bit. Amen. Because the grace and mercy really is where this this chapter hangs on is grace and mercy. Grace is 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 unmerited favor, as, the, as so many of us define it, and and it is that. But the, but grace is also being divine, being influenced by God, divine influence. Amen. That that God influ, would influence your life so much that it would dictate change, and people would see God in your life. That you would be living by by the power of God and the grace of God. Amen. And, and but uh, mercy is also divine compassion. You see that word here a lot too. And 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 grace and mercy, all those it would seem like opposite, work hand in hand together. That we may have this life together. That we may live this life with God, and and that God would so much work in us, that that He would get the glory, and that we would live such a this life is such a great adventure. I've been I've been uh, walking with Jesus for. Gosh, more than 15 years now, and maybe even a little bit more than that. And I've never had a boring day. See, that that, that flies in the face of what many believe Christianity to believe, right? To be, because a lot of times people would think that Christianity is boring. You gotta you gotta listen to the pastor and the, or the preacher, and it seems like it's boring. But you got it all wrong. This is an exciting life. It's an abundant life. And I want to ask you today that if maybe 
you, you you're a believer. You, you you raised your hand in church. You you have said yes, Lord, I want you in my life. But yet, this story seems a little bit foreign to you. Passing from death to life, having a closeness to God, living for Him. Who am I to live for Him? Why would God want to use me? Oh, I've said the same things. I've said the same things. But it is God who directs my steps. Amen. It is God who 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 makes a way where there is no way. And he could do that for you today. So today, I, I just want to I want to pray for you. Maybe the, those of you who are listening to this message and you're you're saying, I, I have no idea what that what that pastor is talking about, that bald headed dude with the white with the white hair on his chin. I have no idea what he's talking about. But if that's true, I want some of that. All it starts is it starts with Jesus. It starts with surrendering your your life to him and saying, yes, Lord. Whatever that is that that dude was talking about, I want it. And Lord, if you're real and and what he's saying is true, then I I want all of it. Then all you have to do is just pray with me today, amen. All you have to do is pray. And I'm gonna say some words, and it's not it's not any magic in the words or anything like that, but out of your heart. Maybe you're tired of being tired. You've lived in this world, and and you and you've had all this world would have to offer you, and you're just like, isn't there something more? God has something so much more for you. And so today, I just want to pray for you. Today, I just, uh, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, maybe today's that day. The, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Amen. Will you pray with me? All you got to do is say this. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner. I believe that that you died on the cross for my sins, to pay the price that I never could, to have a life that I could never have for my own. I ask that you would you would forgive me of my sins as I accept you as Lord and Savior of my life. I ask you that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me to live the life in which you've called me to live. I ask all this in your precious name. Amen. If that is you and if you prayed that prayer today, I, I just want to ask you to uh, uh, send us a note, send us an email or leave a note here on, on this uh, uh, on this video. This video is going to stay up on our page. So if you happen to listen to it later, feel free to send over and say, you know what? I prayed that prayer with you, Pastor Daniel. And uh, I, I want to get a Bible in your hands. I, I want to be able to connect with you. I want to be able to um, I, I want to be able to, to connect with you, to pray with you. I want to get a Bible in your hands, some material in your hands. I want to make sure that uh, that you're not left alone in this walk. And um, because the Bible does say that uh, sometimes people receive uh, this word with joy and then the devil comes and, and, and snatches that seed away that was planted in your heart. Amen. And so I, I want to be able to connect with you and pray with you and you're not meant to go through this life on your own. And uh, if you're receiving this later on, you could you could also send us a, an email at promiselosangeles at gmail.com. I want to invite you to, to join us on our Thursday night prayer meetings, uh, which is on Zoom. You can uh, uh, you can get all that information on our page. We're, we're posting it periodically. Um, drop a line to us if you have any prayer requests. Uh, email, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, we we have we've given you a, a ton of ways to be able to connect with us. Uh, I want to invite you to keep joining us live on here, and that uh, uh, Lord willing, pray with us as we we make another shift, and and hopefully we'll be back into a, a sanctuary setting and and be able to have a full service here soon. Um, I'm praying for that. I I believe that uh, God has some great things in store for us as we. We look to the minister to, to minister to to the people of Los Angeles. Amen. So God bless you. Um, if uh, you have any questions, please send us a note. Um, once again, here on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, you can email us at promiselosangeles at gmail .com. Join us at our uh, prayer meetings Thursday nights on Zoom, 7 p.m. Uh, you can get that information on our page. I pray that you would have a blessed week. 
Let's pr let me pray for you as we uh, log off, okay? Father, I thank you for all of these who are uh, have logged in into this to your word, Lord, and uh, to hear your word, to hear what you have to say to them today. I pray for your blessings, Lord, that you would bless us this week, dear Father God. You would bless the work of our hands, Lord, as we uh, as we trust in you, as we believe in you, Father God. Um, and, and as we cleave on to you, Father, during these days. Oh, Lord, I just pray for your restoration, dear Father God, in our lives. I pray, Father God, that that the, the hope in which we have in you, Lord, shall not be taken away from us, as your word says. We pray that you would bless our days, dear Father God. Give us good health, dear, we pray. Lord God, draw us closer to you this week, dear Father. And, and I just pray, Lord God, for, for those who are Listen to this message, Lord, either now or later. May you bless them, Father God, with your presence. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a blessed week, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.